Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so the first session is a talk between uh, two music creators, Shunichi Tokura and uh, Bjorn Ubers. Bjorn, uh, please turn on your camera now. Thank you very much. Here we are. Okay, uh, it is my great honor and the pleasure to start the first session with two very distinguished uh, music creators. Uh, Mr. Shuichi Tokura is a Japanese composer, arranger, producer, and he is chairman of APMA. And Mr. Bjorn Ubers is a Swedish songwriter, musician, singer, guitarist, producer, and a member of the Swedish musical group, ABBA. He's president of CISAC, the International Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers, which is a global network of 230 member authors societies in 121 countries, that's CISAC. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Tokura, would you start the talk session? Thank you. Thank you, Satoshi. And uh, Bjorn, um, good morning to you. Good morning to you. Oh, good evening to you. Yes, good evening okay. here. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to congratulate you um, that you took over the presidency of CISAC in this hard time uh, during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, I... I believe that I'm one of the uh, many followers of yours and your contribution, your creation and your activities throughout the years. And we we're very happy that you took uh, this role as a president of CISAC. So yeah. how are you keeping it up during this pandemic as a president of CISAC to start with? Well, um, obviously I was, I was asked to become president before the pandemic. So I had already ex accepted. Okay. Uh, but, uh, it took a while. I, I had to think long and hard whether I could be president of anything. Mm. <laughs> but but in the end, I decided, yeah, maybe I can do something, you know, with my experience and my background, uh, something that could be valuable to CSAC. So I decided to accept. Sure. Mm. And, and during this time, uh, it's been very interesting. I've had um, many Zoom meetings. Uh, yeah. I, I meet um, uh, weekly with uh, Gadi Oron, who is the CEO of CISAC, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my primary reason of becoming president was that I, I have a vision of, um, of, of a global solution to this fragmentation of rights and, mm. and data that... Um, is, is happening because of, of the digital era and the streaming services. They're, they're all cloud-based and, mm. and the CMO um, infrastructure wasn't quite ready for, right. I think, the onslaught of the streaming services. So that's, that's one of my, my greatest concerns is for the CMOs to keep up mm. uh, technologically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are uh, you're 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 now uh, in Sweden, right? I am in Sweden right now. In my, yeah, and do you do you have any opportunity to visit um, CISAC in Paris? Uh, not yet. Sadly. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So, was, um, I, I've been wanting to go down there and and uh, meet all the people, but the right. pandemic held me back. Yeah, but there's so many you know, uh, modern tools that we can communicate with each other. And that's one of the subjects that we want to get into. But before that, um, it's, it's inevitable that we will start with this tonight with this COVID-19 situation. Yeah. Um, and the entire entertainment industry is not only suffering financially, but, you know, overshadowed by um, discouragement, lack of hope, despair, whatever you want to call it. And we have found ways to communicate through various me, um, media, uh, medias and, and to transmit our music. But I'm sure many people will agree that for me, music is all about human contact 
and mm. communications. Yeah. And to lack that, you know, takes away something very important from us. Um, but having said that, we do have various modern tools that we utilize in our daily life, uh, which help um, us during this pandemic. Um, and that goes for our musical activities as well. Our life, our activities, even our musical creation is so dependent on these digital modern tools. What I wanted to ask you, if you can describe to us how your activities have changed and for that matter, um, your environment um, and your thoughts of maybe it goes maybe to the musical com consumption of people, um, you know, in this digital era. And yeah. something, sometimes it's very convenient. Sometimes we lose something through that. What do you think about that? Uh, I think uh, we've come to realize that uh, in, uh, at a concert, I think, you know, almost 50% of the experience is to be in an audience and, and the uh, contact between the performer and the audience is something that cannot be substituted with uh, Zoom. It's absolutely impossible. Absolutely. Uh, that, that, and, and I have, I have several theaters in, in Stockholm and of course, I have musicals running uh, that were running before um, in in London and, and many other places. And everything is is closed down, and that it's very sad. Um, you know, the artists used to um, make seventy percent of their income. Of about seventy percent of their income was from live entertainment, from live gigs, and now they suddenly found but you know, they are in the same position as the songwriters have always been, you know, that, that they earn too little money mm. and which has put the focus, I think, on the songwriter more than ever, mm. because this business of our has, has never been more centered on the song than it is right now. Mm. The song is everything. I mean, I have uh, grandchildren who, who listen to music on Spotify and they listen to songs. They don't even know who the artist is. No. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing then that the songwriter should be in the periphery, always the poor cousin to, um, to the recording in our world. And I think this could be the year of the song. I hope sincerely it will be. Yeah. When, when, you know, when, when the streaming services may look, look at the song as important as it is. Mm. Okay. Um, absolutely. Um, this environment that, that we live in is so strange, and especially with this COVID, things are really rapidly changing people's mind as well as... Um, you know, not only performance, but for creation as well. Um, did it change your, I mean, obviously you're still creating many music at home. Mm -hmm. You know, what, has it changed your ways of doing music? It, it, ha it, it, it hasn't really because Benny Anderson and I, um, we can still meet, you know, at his, or my place because mm. it's it's big and airy, mm -hmm. and and we can uh, keep the distance, and and so I've always uh, written with him, so it hasn't changed for me, but I'm sure that it has changed for so many millions of songwriters yes. around the globe. Mm. Uh, I find that mm. meetings like this, like uh, or meetings about economy, uh, about whatever can take place via Zoom, but creative meetings, then you need to be able to see, to be, be able to reply immediately. You need to see people's reactions in, mm. in a different way. Um, so I, I'm missing that. Yes. I'm right in the middle of a, pro a project where um, um, with digital copies of ABBA, Mm. who are going to be performing as avatars um, in London in a, in a purpose-built arena. 
and that is a lot of creative work around that, which now has to be through Zoom. But I mean, what can you do? Hmm. There's yeah, nothing else you can do. Absolutely. Now, um, today's topic, um, as many of you have seen in, in, in the invitation, is copyright buyout. Um, buyout has its history from very early days in the music industry when copyright awareness was still very immature. And here in Japan, um, you know, buyout was, it was not a common practice, but it was there in the 60s and the 70s, um, mm. especially when it comes to, um, for example, advertisements, jingles, theme music for television, motion picture. I myself had multiple buyout experiences on TV commercials, et cetera. And I, I thought in those days, in the 60s and the 70s, I thought it was paid pretty handsomely and I had no complaints. But um, Bjorn, I, I think you agree that nowadays when there's so many ways musical creation is utilized in vast quanti quantities and mm. generates a huge amount of remuner remuneration, creators yeah. should be aware of the nature of their rights. So um, can you share with me maybe your experience in maybe in your early career um, that, you know, something similar to this situation I just, just uh, explained um, uh, was in part of your, in, in your world? Yeah, well, uh, I suppose I was lucky. Um, I started writing in the latter half of, of the 60s, 1960s. Okay. Um, and and it, even back then, there was never any talk of buyout in Sweden. And it, it simply didn't happen. I, I didn't oh, wow. know about it even. It was, uh, you know, you wrote a song and, and you got registered with uh, Stim, which is the CMO of Sweden. Um, and you, you got your royalties. <laughs> so I, I was I was very lucky, but um, emotionally I I tried to put myself in the shoes of someone who has parted with his rights completely mm. of a song that then becomes you know uh, something which is lasting maybe and which is being played. It would be terrible mm. um, to be in that situation. I, but did you ever, did you ever, was there ever any buyout of your material that still is played now and you regret it? I, I, I hear, sometimes I hear a little jingle for about 3.5 seconds, something like uh, that. And said, hey, that, that rings a bell, maybe yeah. 40 years ago, you know, but in those days it was like, um, you know, I, I was doing it for fun and I, I wanted to, you know, it, it was great to have a work, uh, you know, whatever it was in my early 20s, for example. So, um, you know, but I still, you know, hear all these little sounds or yeah. even the little arrangements that I did that mm -hmm. um, is still, uh, you know, because when the company grew and it grew to be a big, huge a company with a tradition, you know, with uh, all these uh, huge capacity of their marketing and all that. And, and, you know, people are so used to these kind of little catchphrase, if you like, uh, of these um, companies and, and um, they still use it. So, yeah. and, uh, and I, to be quite honest, strangely, uh, I never uh, made a fuss about it. No, no. <laughs> but if it had been a whole song, and, and uh, a song that would have uh, lived through decades, then you, you might have been a bit more disappointed. Exactly. But I think with my experience, uh, the only thing I can say to young songwriters is, or, or they need to be educated. They, they need to absolutely be advised in the matter of what it could mean to them. Absolutely. Um, if, if they go for a buyout. Mm -hmm. it be, be, because I think in the end, if you do it with your, a song that you've written with your heart mm. and which is dear to you and which you think is a really good song, then uh, to let people buy it out completely could be uh, very tragic, very, yes. very, very sad. 
Mm. And I think that's the most important point. Exactly. Don't, don't do it. If you, if you really <laughs> love that song, absolutely mm. do not let them buy it out. Exactly. Well, when we talk about buyouts and what we want to focus is the pro problematic buyouts, if, and I, which I call it like a subju subjugated buyout, for example. Um, that is when a party with a dominant preponderance force a deal with the young creator who yeah. cannot repudiate. So mm -hmm. um, if you want to say no, you got to really know, and exactly like you say, if you want to say no, you have to know, have a knowledge of what your rights are. And yes. without that, you know, like I told you earlier, when you're a young songwriter, you're so happy uh, to have your um, song published or broadcast or, you know, streamed or whatever, and you'll mm -hmm. do everything for it, you know, just, just have your name on it. And, but remuneration is a different issue and it takes time for a young creator to learn that. And so exactly yeah. like you say, Education, yes. Education is the name of the word, isn't it? And I, I think also uh, the lawmaker hmm. must help. There must okay. be rules. It almost like you have to write. You have to read the young songwriter, the <clears throat> Miranda rights. You know, are you? Have you asked an advisor? Have you done this or that before you take this decision? Hmm. Uh, that that would be a good thing if if that was. If, if a document signed for a buyout mm. must be preceded by making sure that the writer knows exactly what he's doing. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, APMA has, um, we're trying to uh, develop some kind of an educational um, system, seminar, for example, et cetera, because there, in, in, in Asian Pacific region, um, there are still many cases that, we discuss in our executive committee or in their general assembly. It's unlike North America or in Europe. It's still, there's so many underdeveloping countries, but you know, there are brilliant, brilliant, you know, minds, talents in the Southeast. You know, we have, APMA has 21 members now. Um, we started in 2016 with eight countries. Now it's 21 countries. The last country who joined us was Nepal. And the Nepalese um, young composer who came to Tokyo with Jezrex invitation just, uh, you know, introduced us a lot of cases that they were practically ripped off. Mm. Um, some, yeah. uh, a very renowned composer from Thailand, his name was um, uh, Tanit Chernopipat. He's uh, one uh -huh. of the board member of APMA. And, and he's, he's a, he's a well-known composer today. But, you know, and he's a performer as well. And, and, and last time when he introduced us with his episode, it was like he had to pay an amount of money just to perform his own songs. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was, oh. It's absurd. It's absurd. <laughs> and so it really is, is, is the situation. So in, in, in Asian Pacific region, especially APMA is, is working pretty hard to... Uh, to, to educate, educate these yes, young yes. creators. I suppose that could be a, a, a kind of compromise because to work for hire uh, could be a way for a young composer to uh, get going. Um, but then um, the buyout shouldn't be for more than say 10 years and then the rights sh should revert. Yes, That exactly. is all, also an, uh, a solution because um, for a young writer to get royalties to start flowing in, he needs a body of work. Mm. And maybe to start him off, it's good to work for hire for a while. Exactly, yes. Um, I think um, it uh, depends on, on the region, depends on the market, um, but um, I totally agree um, that we need um, uh, help of CSAC, for example, an international operation, and, and, and to focus on these areas in the world um, globally, you know, focus globally on which areas that um, these education, their efforts must be focused on. And, yeah. and I think uh, Asia Pacific region need all the help we can get. 
Mm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we have to, um, our time is, uh, <laughs> yes, Satoshi has been staring at me. So, um, but, you know, lastly, um, I want for you to explain or to, to uh, tell us how you feel about, um, do, do you feel there's going to be a huge change in the music world after this pandemic, post COVID-19, as far as creations, in a consume consumption marketing whatever because you know this has changed our life so dramatically drastically it, it, it has and the use of, of music the, the listening has gone up um and it people m music is more important to people than ever i think um it's just that the music industry is the ecosystem is dysfunctional because it doesn't reward those who are in the middle enough. And I'm, I'm talking about the songwriters primarily. Mm -hmm. um, the, those who are the most important to the business are in the periphery when it comes to payments. Mm. Um, and that has to change, obviously. And the solutions, uh, what are they? Well, as it is right now, four times, the, the, the labels um, are getting paid four times as much as, as the publishers mm -hmm. by the DSPs. Mm -hmm. That's an imbalance that has to be addressed. And I, I think the CMOs need to be uh, more effective. Okay. They, need, they need to step up their technology and, and they need global um, solutions cloud-based global solutions. I think that uh, the, it, it's a shame that the GRD, the, the uh, global repertoire uh, database mm. was shut down because song, it's not in the interest of the songwriters for the CMOs to compete with database. Mm. Mm. The CMOs should compete with their service to the songwriter. And, and they should ask themselves, whenever they do something, is this in the interest of our songwriters or not? Mm. And, and sometimes I think that the CMOs look at themselves as entities that are competing. And I think mm. that's completely wrong. Okay. I think they need to look for third party solutions, uh, global solutions to the problem of inaccurate metadata. Okay, okay. So uh, I yeah. think we can conclude this, that, you know, whatever we do, however we do it, um, we, we will talk um, with Jazz Rack um, in, in, in the coming days, post COVID-19, obviously. But, you know, I think the key word, you know, Olympic game is coming and everything was so in a turmoil this past six months and luckily, we seem to um, be the torch marathon has started today. Yeah. And so um, I'm crossing my fingers that, 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 um, that the Olympic games would, uh, would uh, be successful this, this yeah. summer here. Um, but, you know, during all these difficulties, the, the key word was athletes first. That was the key word of the Olympic committee. Okay. But yeah. I'm telling if athlete first, you know, in the music world, why not somebody says creators first? Yeah. Artists, right? I mean, that would, might be the key word for our... That is, that is certainly a good key word. <laughs> Isn't it? Yes. So, Satoshi, is it the time is out thank now? You. Yeah. So we thank uh, Bjorn for joining us um, tonight. And it was lovely talking to you. And I hope Very to meet you, meet you in yeah. person in the near future. Uh, yes, absolutely. And I hope you have a good, um, uh, good seminar um, going forward with, with the buyouts. It's a very, very important issue. And I'm glad that you, you're uh, taking time discussing it. Thank you. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you. And that's bye -bye. for now, right? Bye. Bye, bye. everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> It's very...